Today I'm speaking with Jorge Quintero, and today's video, it will be interesting. It will be about brain, about neuroscience, and about what we can do about ourselves to make our brains to be more efficient and healthy. So Jorge, can you please tell us about what you do and how did you get to the decision that you need to choose exactly that particular path? Uh, and if you, if you can give our viewers an, a general overview about what profession is responsible for which, for which area of study and work uh, in all of this confusing and intriguing psychology field. So everyone kind of understand what's the situation. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Daniel. My name, as you said, is Jorge Quintero. I'm 25 years old. I received my degree in electrical engineering, um, which is interesting because it doesn't really tie so much to the current profession that I, I'm in right now. Right now I work mostly as a sales engineer, selling and supporting technologies that are used in deep brain stimulation surgery. So I'm present in the operating room with neurosurgeons, with neurologists, I work in labs with neuroscientists that do animal research. They record from the neurons of animals like rats, monkeys, um, and other small mammals. And really my path was not very linear. I, I started off working in a, in a design um, position, pretty much designing and creating memory chips for consumer electronics. So if you've ever looked at a motherboard or ever looked at uh, you know, the inside of a computer or a TV and you see all the little black rectangles and squares, I was essentially designing those. And it was a very electrical engineering focused position, but I didn't like my job at all because I, I was pretty unhappy with the environment. I couldn't connect with my colleagues who were all about 15 years older than me. And, um, and I just wanted to find something more fulfilling. So I kind of went on some soul searching I actually was in real estate for maybe a little more than a year. Um, it didn't work out for me. And I kind of decided to combine the two experiences. So I combined the, uh, the, the skills that I gained in real estate, which are sales and marketing with my engineering skills that I learned in university. And now I'm working as a sales engineer. So I understand the technologies. I understand how it's produced and how it's designed, but I mostly just sell these technologies to neuroscientists and neurosurgeons. And uh, basically your Instagram page is, what is this all about? Let's talk about this. Cause, uh... Yeah, yeah. So um, now that I've explained how I got to the position that I'm in now, um, one, of the, one of the most amazing things about how my Instagram page, Mindfully Conscious, started is it started literally because of my job. So I was, uh, I, after I got trained, after about a month and a half or two months, I attended my first deep brain stimulation surgery. And for those that are unfamiliar with what the surgery is about, you essentially implant an electrode into, a, into the patient's head. They, they have some sort of movement disorder like Parkinson's disease, a central tremor and dystonia. And so imagine getting a pacemaker for your brain instead of your heart. And this, this electrode is going to shock a very um, specific part deep inside the brain that they that many scientists and many people believe is responsible for the the maladaptive or the pathological states that these patients experience so all the tremors their inability to move and to walk and to hold things and uh and pretty much any kind of motor skill that these patients have is debilitated because of the disease and with the shocks that our technology creates um, they're able to effectively implant the electrode and pretty much transform the patient's live, uh, life. So that's, that to me when I saw that, that immediately once you start giving these patients shocks and all of the tremors go away, all of the symptoms of the pathology goes away, I was just blown away. I just didn't understand how electricity could just have this huge change in the patient's um, physical state and in their well-being. So I wanted to learn more about what was going on because I didn't know anything about how the brain worked. Like I got trained on the basics, 
but there was just something going on that I had to uh, that I had to understand greater. How many? Sorry for interrupt. How, when was it? How many years ago? Like the first? When, was, when did you see the first time the the, the result of the treatment? Because it, it sounds super impressive. Actually. Yeah, it. I actually saw this um, probably around middle or end of March of 2019. So it was pretty recent, uh -huh. and. So I started reading books about the brain. The first book that I actually picked up was called The Brain, The Story of You by David Eagleman. Mm -hmm. And that book changed my life, man. Not, not because the information in it was, uh, was life changing, but because I started to see just how involved the brain is, not only for thinking, but for movement, for emotions, for personality, for habits. Literally everything that people struggles, struggle with can be connected in some way to the brain. Um, and we can maybe get into this conversation later about like, what does it mean to have a spirit and consciousness and things like that? But it's, it's, it is a fact that your brain is extremely important for your conscious experience and for your ability to do things and to think things and to feel things. So, um, as, as someone that comes from the real estate space where there's a lot of workshops that talk about building your mindset and creating better habits and having a growth mindset and being an effective uh, performer and, and stuff like that, I pretty much connected the two dots between performance, between well-being and stress management and neuroscience. And I wanted to to see if there was anything out there that could kind of give me more information on this, on this, this link between these two things. And I couldn't really find anything. I tried looking on Instagram. I, I tried reading some more books that I thought could give me some insights, but none of them were kind of giving the perspective that I wanted to see. And that's when I realized that I had come across an idea that maybe others would find interesting. And that's how my page, Mind Mindfully Conscious, got started. Actually, uh, the reason that I found your page, I was looking kind of for the same thing on the Instagram about how to make our brain works better, how do we study better, and there is really nothing there, at least there are only a few pages, you, maybe a couple other people, but uh, I also think that this topic, you know, needs to be promoted and it's super interesting, and uh, I guess... Uh, I mean, let's let's just maybe talk about what our brain is and who we are and what our nervous system is. Can you give us a, a bit more explanation so people at least can understand kind of the basics? I know it's super deep. We can speak a lot about single, you know, a single organism in a, in a brain. But let's let's start with some basics to people who are just. Yeah, so I can definitely cover some of the basics just to give the audience some context. And at a high level, when we talk about the nervous system, we're not just talking about the brain itself. We're also talking about the, the spinal cord plus the peripheral nervous system, which consists of all of the connections between the brain and the body. And most people think that the, the nervous system is really just the brain working in isolation and sending commands down, but really the, the brain is being influenced by our body also. It's getting feedback all the time, which is why we can feel things, why we can taste things, why we can hear things. It's trying to always work in this two-way communication fashion between itself and the body, plus the environment. Um, and the the... I think that the brain has five main functions. And if you think about them, I think you pretty much will identify these as covering your entire conscious experience. So the brain can, can sense things. So it can, you have your five senses, you actually have more senses, but the five that people most identify with are seeing, touch, hearing, taste, and smell. We can sense all these things through different forms of, uh, of the, of the kinds of receptors that exist in our bodies. We can perceive things. So the way that we direct our attention to things can change. We can think thoughts. We can, uh, we can feel emotions and we can behave and we can execute movements. So the, all five of these things are governed and controlled by our brain and the nervous system. And in this case, uh 
I want to probably mention that uh, uh, we are the product of the evolution, right? So, like, what is the difference between our, us people and, let's say, I don't know, monkeys? Because, like, let's say if we discuss it, some uh, scientists say that it's only like a couple percent of the DNA difference. Yeah, so an interesting thing about um, the difference between the brains of animals and the brains of humans is that we have an extremely more, um, I don't, it is developed, it is extremely more developed, but the surface area of our brain is just much larger. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever seen a picture of a brain and you see that pink outer layer that's, that looks like a bunch of squiggles and it's all folded and stuff like that, that's the reason why we have so much brain power and the brain kind of folds itself in the, in this fashion, having gy gyri and, uh, and sul sulci is because if it folds itself in this way, you can essentially pack more neurons in the same space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the human brain has about 86 billion neurons that connect with other neurons in thousands of connections. So it's not just like a, one connection between neurons is thousands. So you have trillions of connections in your brain that are all working at different times to kind of produce the complex ex experience that is your life. But now compare that to other animals, not only are they, do, do their brains have less surface area, but they also lack, um, they lack the complexity of having a, a very developed frontal lobe, which in humans is the seed of a lot of conscious thinking, a lot of planning and reasoning and, and higher cognitive functions Basically. like language. What's and, called um, your neocortex, right? Exactly, the neocortex. But one thing that I do want to mention that is a similarity between animal brains and human brains is that the brain kind of developed like an onion where you have the innermost layers that are the most primitive that are similar to other animals. And you have over over the course of evolution, the brain kind of builds itself outward. And as you go more outward, you kind of come across more high, uh, high cognitive, recently evolved brain areas. So the, the outermost surface of the brain that you see um, in pictures, that's the most recently evolved area. And the reason why we can, we can study the human brain in animals like rats and small mammals and monkeys is because they have parts of evolution that are similar to us. For example, we can learn a lot about how we learn and how we feel things, how, how our emotions are created by studying the brains of rats. Mm -hmm. And just because it's a rat, yes, it's not human, but a lot of the circuitry and a lot of the brain structures that are in a rat are also present in us. And so this can bring out some conversation about how our brains are driven by more primitive instincts, right? Like we're not, not only are we high level thinkers and we can communicate and we have language and problem solving and creativity, but we also have aspects of ourselves that are more primal, that just want to reproduce, that just want to uh, satisfy hunger and thirst and, and that are driven by emotions and, and all sorts of things Might like that. Might be some fears as well. And exactly. you know, it's also interesting when I guess that, uh, that, that, that area, uh, you know, those more ancient areas of the brain, they, they, they would be responsible for some of your subconsciousness fears and stuff like that, that you, you know, ha you have them, but you don't know where they're coming from. Do you know this, this area of the study? So I, I have read about this, um, and I do know quite a bit about fear. Um, fear is a stress response that is activated at a subconscious level. And there's a, there's a brain structure called the, the amygdala that pretty much tastes all the incoming sensory information. And it checks all of the sensory inputs from your five senses. And it checks with another brain structure called the hippocampus to determine if there's anything, any pattern in the in the sensory information that's coming from your environment that signals some sort of threat and this this is, happens even before your vision has even processed what is in your environment so if you've ever if you've ever been in a really scary situation let's say 
like a dog, a, a, a really vicious dog is running after you. And if, if, you've ever been, yeah, if you've ever been in that situation, you'll probably start running before you even know what you're running away from. And mm -hmm. it's because of this brain area that kind of triggers the stress response or the fight or flight response as, as it's commonly called. And, um, and your, um, your, the stress in your body will actually activate long before that you have any conscious awareness of it. So your hand, your, your heart rate will go up. Your hands might start getting sweaty or cold. Your, your breathing will start getting short and choppy and will get faster. And, um, and all of this, like I said earlier, your nervous system is connected to your body. So your brain is reading these signals from your body and it's going to elevate the feelings of stress in your mind also. So um, fear is an unconscious response that we then give it a name, whether it's fear, anxiety, stress, whatever, nervousness. And depending on how we consciously interpret the fear or the stress will determine whether we continue to feel even more stress or whether we quiet that stress down and we tell our bodies to kind of calm down because we're not in a stress situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, in this case, our consciousness is kind of like a, a processor that, 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 that we can operate the rest of the brain or what is it? Like, let's yeah, see, so, so let's try to figure this question out. Yeah, so the, the neocortex, like you mentioned earlier, Daniel, the frontal lobe, which is the part of the brain that's right behind the forehead, it is such an important part of the brain for the regulation of emotions and behavior. And there's research that, ex that shows that just having different conscious interpretations of the feeling of fear and stress has very big effects on the, the stress that you feel in your body. And uh, well, what exactly do you mean here? Like different, the way we describe it to ourselves or? Yeah, so, so for example, let's say that I'm about to give a presentation to a crowd and uh -huh. I feel scared that I'm gonna mess up, right? Uh -huh. I, I start getting nervous because I'm about to, I'm about to present and I just want it to go really well, but I don't know what's gonna happen. I could tell myself something like, wow, I'm super nervous. I, I'm thinking about the worst case scenario. I'm thinking about all the mistakes that I could potentially make. That's gonna stress me out even more, right? Sure. <laughs> sure. But if I, instead if I take an interpretation like, you know what, I'm nervous because this is natural. I'm gonna be presenting in front of a large crowd of people, but I presented, I practiced this a lot. In my practice runs, I did this flawlessly. If I make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. I can catch myself and continue strong. Having this kind of mindset whenever you feel fear or stress actually will quiet the nerves down and will reassure you and give you more confidence. So there's research that shows that just changing the way that you think about fear and stress actually has an impact on the subsequent stress and fear that you feel in that moment. Oh, that's actually super exciting because you can... You can do it, you know, in basically every part of your life, right? Exactly. And I want to mention also that because your body and your brain are connected, you can also influence your feelings of calm by influencing your body. Now, you can't control your heart rate consciously. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You can't control that your, your saliva dried up in your mouth because you're nervous. You can't really control, um, you know, like the, the, the insulin production in your, in your body but you can control your lungs, like you can control how you breathe, and you can also control what you look at. And these are two easy ways that you can actually manage stress in real time. So one of the, like I said earlier, one of the key physiological signs of stress is that your breathing just speeds up and it gets shorter and choppier. If you just slow down your breathing and you breathe through the diaphragm, your diaphragm actually has a nerve that connects straight to your brain that, um, that can signal to it that you're not stressed or you are stressed. And by slowing down your breathing, you actually signal back to your brain that you're not as stressed as, as it thinks you are. And it actually reduces cortisol and stress hormones. Well, so and, then, can, and then brain signals to your heart and then to your 
Oh, are exactly. they working? So, so you can actually change the way that you feel by changing the way that your body feels. Another way that you can do that also is through, through your gaze. So whenever we're stressed, our pupils dilate, they get bigger so that they can take in more information from the environment. Mm -hmm. um, if you just unfocus your gaze and you, you try to observe everything that's in your environment, like you, you pretty much get out of that tunnel vision state, that also has an effect of signaling back to your brain that you're not as stressed as it thinks you are and it'll calm you down. This is a short term. What about long term? How do we deal with the long term? Is there? Any yes. So cool the, this is definitely for short term um, overwhelming stress that you feel in the moment. But if you are someone that is chronically stressed, then what happens is that over time, your brain will rewire so that this amygdala that I mentioned earlier that kind of triggers the stress response becomes very hypersensitive. And anything that can that triggers us is because of this hypersensitive amygdala. So you essentially need to, to adopt a practice where you try to suppress that sensitivity so that it doesn't trigger so often and you're not stressed all the time. One of the best ways to do this is through meditation. So you remember, remember how I mentioned how the frontal lobe is so key for emotional regulation and, um, and, and inhibition of certain behaviors. When you have a very strong frontal lobe, you have a lot of connections that go from the frontal lobe to the amygdala that actually inhibit its activation. And these connections can be strengthened and increased by meditation, by mm -hmm. stress management meditation. So if you are someone that wants to feel calmer, that wants to reduce the amount of overall stress levels in your life, spend 10 to 15 minutes um, as much as you can throughout the week. I recommend doing this three to four times, 10 to 15 minutes, where you literally just focus on your breathing and you detach yourself from your thoughts because a lot of stress in our lives comes from identifying too closely with our mind and our thoughts. So whenever a thought pops into our head that is stressful and we just cling to it and we try to suppress it, it'll, it'll never go away, right? But if we can calm our bodies to, and, and allow our body to influence our mind, we can get into this, uh, into this pattern where we build more connections to kind of not only to, uh, to downregulate the amygdala, make it less sensitive so we don't get triggered, but our body also, we also train ourselves to always be able to look to our body to influence our mind. And, uh, and it's a very great stress management tool. This is interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, actually uh, the word rewire. So that's, that's another concept that I wanted to talk about. Neuroplasticity, right? Let's yes. This and let's get deeper into this because this is also one of the basic concepts uh, of the of the brain, and it's it's quite recent. I mean, before we didn't know that it exists. Uh, can you give us a, a bit more details here? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up neuroplasticity because it's honestly one of my favorite topics to talk about, and it explains so many things about the human experience, like. Neuroplasticity is the brain's inherent property to constantly adapt and constantly change the connections between neurons in response to experience. So if you've ever noticed, kids can pick up skills super easily. They don't even have to study. They can just observe. They can just be in an environment and they pick up things from other people. And, um, and that's neuroplasticity working in full speed, you know? They don't need to pay attention like adults do to learn things. And for a long period of time, it was believed that only kids had access to this plasticity, this ability to kind of absorb information and to, to grow and change almost passively. But modern research, and I think this research has really only been around for less than 100 years. Um, and it's only recently been firmly established that neuroplasticity is actually available to people all throughout the lifespan from birth to the day that you die. Now, the difference between childhood and adulthood though, is that in, in adults, if you wanna learn something, you can't just passively observe something and then pick it up. 
it requires attention, it requires focus, and it requires repetition, and even maybe some stress or some, some emotions in there also. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the, wherever our attention goes, energy goes, flows to those brain areas. And um, whenever we have our, those specific brain areas that are activated, wh wherever we're paying attention to, so let's say we're trying to, we're trying to just enjoy the beach, and we're looking out into the distance and we see the ocean, we see the, the sand and we see the, the sky and stuff and it fills us with this feeling of relaxation and happiness. That is going to be, become etched into your mind because the, you're paying attention to the experience. You're going to strengthen the connections that are activated by processing the, the image of the beach and the emotions of being on the beach. And that's how memories are created but it doesn't just work with memories. It works with behaviors. It works with thoughts. It works with all sorts of things that are, that are part of our mindset. Um, and one of the best things about neuroplasticity is that it's given a scientific or even, even an, a biological backing to what Carol Dweck coined not too long ago as the growth mindset. So because we have neuroplasticity, if we pay enough attention to something, if we focus enough, if we push past difficulty enough, when we give it enough attempts, we eventually get better at something. We're not just born with a, a certain set of skills that can't be changed or can't be improved down the road, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and neuroplasticity is also the reason why we forget things. When we don't repeat them, what happens to those connections? They actually get weaker and because the connections get weaker, it becomes harder to recall those things. And if you don't practice them enough, we eventually forget them. So neuroplasticity is this brain property where it's always prioritizing the most repeated, most frequent connections in the brain, or most frequently utilized connections in the brain, and it will deprioritize and weaken the connections that are not used very often. Uh, is there some sort of I don't know, uh, organ in your brain or some sort of uh, DNA maybe out there that is responsible for some people getting some area of knowledge faster than another one? Or is it just a number of time that, that you know, repetition? Because if you like something, you would probably repeat it more and more and more to, to satisfy yourself. Uh, so how does this enjoyment connect to the to the brain activity? Is there any certain area in the brain where we store our employment for the certain things? Or do you know any information here? Is there any research that, that you've done or anything? Yeah, so um, in terms of having kind of like an affinity for, for certain talents or skills versus not, I think it, it's partly genetic. Like I think your parents will have some influence on the kind of things that you like to do but also the, what you're exposed to as a child kind of serves as a foundational substrate for what you can learn later. So if you've, if you've learned guitar, for example, you had to play guitar when you're younger and then you leave it for a, a long period of time and then you return to it in adulthood, you'll find that it's easier to pick that up as opposed to if you've never learned guitar before and you wanna learn guitar when you're 30 years old or 35 years old. So the, what you learn when you're a child has a big impact on what you can learn later, but you can absolutely learn all sorts of things when you get older. It might just be to different degrees based on what you were exposed to as a child. And that's why it's so important to give your children as enriched environments as possible because you wanna essentially set them up so that they can learn anything that they want to when they're older. And if they have some exposure to it when they're younger, they'll be, it would be easier for them to learn it when they're older. Mm -hmm. And regarding the enjoyment, let's say you enjoy playing guitar, but you don't enjoy cooking. Where does that come from? Because most likely you would probably uh, do what you enjoy more, regardless of what, what you're better at. Because I know some people, they, they cook good, they don't like it. <laughs> but, you know, they, they would like to play guitar, but they're terrible at it. Uh, but... Yeah, I think, I think it's really just about how you interpret the experience, right? Like maybe 
the person just had a tough time learning it as a child and then they just put that into their head that they just don't like doing it mm-hmm. or they you know in the example that you gave about cooking the person might think that the amount of time that it takes to prepare the ingredients and to cook the food and then wash the food is just too much for them so they, they don't like wasting that much time you know i think the interpretation of it really matters because that's really where we get our enjoyment or our disappointment from it's really our expectations and how reality kind of matches those expectations right like if we think that we're going to learn guitar in five hours and we've spent 10 hours and we're not even good at it at all at all you know we're going to be pretty disappointed so i think it really ties into expectations mm-hmm, mm-hmm, interesting um actually now i want to speak about because you've mentioned that 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 you, you you sell some brain you sell the equipment to the neuroscientists and to the laboratories uh, most impressive uh research uh, that or, or or current study uh that some laboratory does that you know of mm. so i can't pinpoint the exact study but i know that there's the the technology deep brain stimulation uh surgery is not only impacting people with movement disorders now but they're the neurosurgeons and neurologists are actually experimenting this technology with other disorders like epilepsy, OCD, depression, Tourette syndrome, and it's showing great promise. So there's people don't understand why deep brain stimulation works. Like if you were let's, to ask a, ner- a let's neurosur- talk about actually why it works. Yes, let's let's. Yeah, they don't understand why it works. Oh, you mean even neuroscientists don't understand? No, we we don't But, understand. We don't understand why it works. We just know that it does. Because But, there, there's a so so the debate it comes down to two things. We don't know whether the shocks produce an inhibition of activity in in particular areas that are causing the problem or if it's overexciting them and that overexcitement is causing um the relief of the symptoms it's very inconclusive and people have gotten together all people from all sorts of uh, areas of neuroscience and they still can't decide why it works but how did they find out about it how did it happen that someone just placed an electrode wire into the brain what, what was when was it the first uh, time <laughs> honestly i i don't know actually how the origin started it's a it's a procedure that's only been around maybe for 40 years yeah, yeah, yeah but um i i think what happened was people would just said you know what the brain is just a piece of me with electricity running inside let's just see what happens if we shock this piece you know like <laughs> let's see what happens and um and it actually has a very good uh very good outcomes i think also what what they wanted to uh to do was uh before deep brain stimulation was a was a thing they were originally um performing what's called an ablation procedure so they would go into the particular area that was causing the problem and they would burn those cells and um and so they they saw outcomes they saw good outcomes with that but the problem is is that if they don't if they don't get the right spot they burn those cells forever. The thing about neurons is that they don't reproduce like other cells in your body. They don't undergo mitosis. At least for the most part, like 99% of your brain does not have the ability to kind of regenerate those neurons. So they people didn't didn't feel comfortable doing that anymore where they were burning brain tissue. So they they wanted to try something else and and brain deep brain stimulation was another technique that they decided to try. And um, and they've never gone back since then. So they don't they don't perform these ablation procedures anymore. They just implant um, if they're going to do to go inside the brain. And this electrode actually interesting. How does it look? So it's like wire that is connected to something mm-hmm. outside of your brain, and then you power it, or it's just like one time thing when you cut this scalp. Yeah. So so the way that the wire looks, the way that the wire looks is it it looks just just like a wire let me uh use my charger for a second so imagine just like a long kind of electrode like this 
Uh -huh. It has some cir circular ring contacts, like four of them that are kind of on the edge. You would implant kind of like this at an angle. It would go uh -huh. to the this particular position that you want to stimulate, and then they would start testing it to make sure that they don't get any unwanted side effects and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But the electrode comes out of the head. They, they push it under the skin behind the ear, and then they have a pacemaker or a battery, as they call it, that they put under the skin in the chest and that's where the wire connects to. So the patient has to get this, um, this battery replaced like maybe once every 10 years. Mm -hmm. Or um, if, if there's an infection or something, they have to come back, but the infection rate is pretty low. So that's basically where Neuralink is going with their uh, brain computer interfaces, right? Yeah, and that's another, um, that's another very interesting form of research that I was debating on discussing earlier, but it is absolutely fascinating to think that we're getting to the point where our recording technology is so advanced that we're starting to be able to record from 500 sites, a thousand sites. My company is actually developing a product that will eventually be able to record from 32,000 sites. Can you imagine recording from 30, 32,000 locations in the brain? That's so many. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so, so many. It's like 32,000 wires, basically. Is that what it is? Yeah, but it, it wouldn't be 32,000 wires. It would be pretty much a um, kind of like an electrode array that was just very integrated. And mm. you would have some sort of uh, serializer that would kind of push the data in serial. So you wouldn't have like parallel wires. It would just be a few wires that transmit all the data Wow. And then what uh, exactly do you use it for? Like, like Yeah, so some of the applications right now, um, I know that Elon Musk, he wants to return vision to blind people. Mm -hmm. And one of the fascinating things about vision is that vision isn't done with your eyes. It, it, it doesn't happen in your eyes. It actually happens in your brain. Mm -hmm. And it happens in the very back kind of like above the nape of your neck, it's called the occipital lobe. So we talked about the frontal lobe, which is in the behind your forehead. Now go to behind your head, that's the occipital lobe. Mm -hmm. And um, all the visual processing happens there. So what Elon Musk wants to do is he wants to take data from your eye, connect that to your visual cortex, and allow the visual cortex to become stimulated enough to produce a meaningful image for you so that you can actually see um, another application to this is being able to control robotic arms and, and prosthetics with your mind. So, um, you know, one of the jobs that I mentioned earlier that the brain is capable of is executing movement, not only executing movement, but planning movement. And if, if we can just record the, uh, the brain activity that's happening in these motor areas, and translate that into physical movement to a robotic arm, we could essentially give people prosthetics that are very natural and that move exactly the way they, that the person wants them to, kind of like your arm. So if I wanted to lift my arm up, it feels effortless, but there's a lot of brain activity that's going on to coordinate more, that. More, more cortex, yeah. mm. It's interesting because I see that there are also, maybe in future, uh, there are possibility of uh, Programming, programming language based on, 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 on this, because uh, technically if you can modulate your arm movement, you can do a programming language or you, you, you can even, I don't know, talk to each other through the brains. And then I, I wonder what would happen if, like, let's say if we connect uh, uh, my brain to your brain through the wires, you know, like, let's say we run a couple thousand wires between our brains, would I be able to, you know, to, to teach you something through those wires or no? This is also interesting. But um, yeah, so let me just add something to that because um, th this thought experiment was actually done in a book called "The Feeling of Life Itself" by Chris. I think his name is Dr. Koch, C O C H. And um, in this thought experiment, he he asked, "What would happen?" if you had enough connections between two people's brains, like would you be able to kind of transmit information between the two and 
and um, and just kind of have like these two brains that are communicating independently. But according to the theory that he was presenting in this book, what would happen is like up until a certain number of connections, the two brains would become independent. But as the number of connections between the two brains increased, what would happen is that our brains would essentially become like reservoirs of information that would then integrate into a larger mind. So you would, we would essentially have an elevated level of consciousness where all of your information would be accessed, all of my knowledge would be accessed, but it would, it would become one single mind. It's interesting. Um, actually, uh, I was studying the uh, evolution and if you would take a look generally into how organisms uh, evolve, you would have like single cell, then you would have two cells, organisms, then they unite and then create a system. And then there is a, a neuros system, nervous system introduced in order for those organisms to, to respond to the environment and to, you know, do all the processes inside. And I believe similar situation happens to the human brains and all those movements with like electronics uh, in it and with Neuralink and because then we can connect to each other and kind of become like a big, big brain power. Uh, and I don't know, maybe it's kind of will be a currency of the future where for a couple hours of the, a day you can just connect uh, to the big matrix and then, you know, help other okay, honestly it would it would become like the matrix you know no not the matrix but i mean you 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 would connect and you would help some other people with with your brain to solve their problems like yeah uh, which would be super cool and you can exchange the information and stuff like that uh i mean the future is super big but realistically when do you think that future can happen what you see in the industry. Probably, probably not in our lifetime, man, because so. the, uh, the, the idea of consciousness and sharing consciousness is just very poorly understood right now. Like we, there's, there's, no, there's not even a, a, um, an agreed upon definition of exactly what consciousness is. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why scientific advancements have been so limited in terms of what consciousness is and how we can tap into consciousness and things like that because we just don't know um, exactly where it exists in the mind. Mm -hmm. And um, like, we, there's some key players, don't get me wrong. Like if you were to get injured in the brain stem, which is the area of the brain that kind of connects the, uh, the, 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 the cortex with the spinal cord, if you get damaged there, you pretty much lose your consciousness. But we know that it's, it's, not, just, it's not just in the brain stem, there's other, there's a great number of areas that are kind of integrated together that produce everything that we see, that we hear, that we talk. And those are aspects of consciousness also that cannot be avoided. Do only people have a consciousness or some other animals showing uh, some sort of consciousness as well? Like yeah, and um, this is also in, uh, in Dr. Koch's book, The Feeling of Life Itself. He mentions that because consciousness is not like this thing that just turns on randomly, like you, you reach a certain level of evolution and then you just have consciousness, right? Um, he says that it, it feels like something to be any organism, no matter how simple it is. And, um, and in the end of the book, I remember he makes an argument about how even animals like fish, which people are very, you know, people don't mind killing fish you know, people, there's people that mind killing, um, you know, cows and pigs and, and other farm animals, but we kind of, we kind of neglect fish. Well, there's research that shows that, that fish can experience pain, just like you and I can. They have, they have pain processing areas in their brain and they can experience pain. So it feels it, no matter where you are on the evolutionary ladder, it feels like something to be that organism. It might not feel like it does to, to myself and, and yourself where we have this human experience, but it'll be some other um, altered form of consciousness that is different from you and I, that is mm -hmm. rooted in their biology. It's rooted in the, in the way that they sense things and, and the way that they interpret information from the outside world. Like, like instead of 5,000 operations and saws, they would have like three or something. Like yeah, but 
for example, um, animals that like flies that just have so many different eyes, right? Like they can uh -huh. see all sorts of angles and stuff. That consciousness will be different than ours because we only have two eyes, uh -huh. right? So yeah. it's just it's just going to be different. It's interesting. Super interesting. And we have seven minutes and uh, left. And uh, what I want to speak about is current times. I mean, because it's super stressful and a lot of people, for a lot of people, is basically a life changing event by amount of, you know, changes, educations they need to do because there are a lot of people that are losing jobs. And, uh, but it's always uh, new opportunities as well. So, uh, from 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 a, from a neuroscience standpoint, how do we address those critical times? What do we need to do, and what would you recommend for for people? Maybe some books, maybe some cool podcasts, or some ideas that, that you have in your brain as well. Um, that's, that's yeah. What what I would definitely recommend, um, and I'll give some context to this so that you understand where my tips are coming from. Uh -huh. um, when, with the coronavirus situation and with the recent um, death of George Floyd, we are in a state of hyper alertness. Like whenever we're, we're living our normal lives and we're in a routine and, and the days kind of feel the same, we don't really experience as much stress as, stress as we do now where our routines are broken we have all these negative um, headlines in the news and we're just glued to our phones because we have extra time. Because our routines are broken, what happens is that we go from what's called parallel processing where we can kind of do things simultaneously. We don't really have to think about them. Like I can brush my teeth and tuck in my, my shirt. I don't really have to understand how I do them. I just do them. But now that we're in a, a quarantine situation, we have to think about everything. Like, oh, you know, I have to clean my hands if I touch that doorknob. I, I don't have to go to work anymore, so now I have to change my schedule. Like, you have to think about so many things that we don't, we, we took for granted before. And this has the result of increasing our levels of attention, which increase our levels of stress also. Then you, you tack onto that, the fact that we have all these very negative and, um, these negative headlines with violence and protests and death. And we just are essentially in a state of emotional trauma and emotional overwhelming um, sensations. Like we just don't know what to do with, the, with, uh, with everything that's coming at us. So to tackle this, this problem, what I would suggest is and people have already probably started adapting to this now that we're kind of in the third month. Of the quarantine. But I would definitely suggest if you're still experiencing stress to create a routine where you essentially just try to do things the same way every day and you try to add some more predictability into your life. Because when, when things become predictable, we don't have to think about them anymore and our, and our brains can kind of go into autopilot, which reduces stress. Another thing that I would recommend is to begin a meditation practice allow yourself the time to kind of unplug from from every all the information that's coming in from us because our brains need a break also just because they they can be on all day doesn't mean that they want to be on all day our you know there's a there's something called an otradian rhythm where it's it's a rhythm that occurs in a, in a span of less than 24 hours. You have a circadian rhythm, which is about 24 hours, and then you have ultradian rhythms. And attention is an ultradian rhythm. Like you can only really have peak attention and peak performance for about 90 minutes before the quality of your attention really just degrades. So it, they recommend that you spend about 20 minutes off of the task or whatever you're paying attention to for every 90 minutes of focus because our brains just need to recharge. Um, and, it's, and it's because attention brings stress that you can't just pay attention all day because your level of stress will just keep increasing. And if you don't, if you don't get enough sleep and you don't give yourself breaks, what ends up happening? You end up burning out. And your, your nervous system essentially just shuts down and doesn't let you do anything. You don't have any motivation. You don't feel like doing anything. 
you can't pay attention to anything, you don't feel like processing anything, you don't want to get to that point. So it's important every single day to unplug and to give yourself some quiet time where you're not receiving sensory information, not even music, you don't want to listen to music. But maybe what does help is just having a guided meditation, especially if you're more inexperienced. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend um, going on YouTube and just looking up stress management meditations or um, what's it called? The detachment meditations. If you feel like you can't suppress your thoughts or you, you, your thoughts are triggering you too much, definitely focus on developing those practices three, three to four times a week for 10 to 15 minutes. They're incredibly effective and everybody has 15 minutes. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to suggest is just to go outside and get some sunlight because uh, the sunlight gives you vitamin D, which allows you to produce serotonin. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter that boosts levels of well-being and feelings of calm. So if you can get outside for, for half an hour every day, go for a walk um, or do some exercise, it'll do a lot for your mood. And it'll also do, do you really well, not only for sleep, because exercise increases levels of melatonin which are needed to kind of get you tired and feeling like you can sleep on time, but also it'll, it'll elevate not only your creativity levels, it'll elevate your feelings of happiness and well-being, And, uh, and it's, it's overall a habit that you can develop that will bring better habits with it. Usually it's called a keystone habit for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, this is really good. And I mean, one hour went by pretty quick. <laughs> Interesting conversations. It's super, super, super nice. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, my main goal was to kind of give a light to, you know, uh, some of the concepts that exist in neuroscience and psychology. And then so people, you know, would watch the video and then they can do their own research because the topic is super extensive and there are like hours and hours of videos and books and you, you cannot do it in, in one podcast but uh the goal is to motivate people to learn themselves and read and then i guess they can always uh reach out to you and ask questions and book one-on-one -on -one consultations and uh, yeah thank you very much that was super super enjoyable thank you thank you so much for the invitation daniel it's always a pleasure to be able to talk about these things as you can tell, I'm really passionate about them, so I'm glad you gave me the opportunity. Yep, thank you. Okay.